The end of 2023 is finally upon us, and man, what a year for anime it's been. I watched a lot, covered a lot, and created a lot, and as we look back across every season, we ask ourselves just one big question. Just how good was anime 2023? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was alright. Each year, it just seems like this medium manages to become more and more impressive, and this time around was no exception. Last year, I think I talked about too much in regards as to what I completed, so this year we're doing something different. This time, we're turning the dial down and really honing in on the anime that truly defined 2023. Coming up with the choices certainly wasn't the easiest thing, as across the board, there were a lot of good stories that unfolded across the seasons, but there were some shows that really stuck out this year that I'm sure many of you could probably guess on. Before we get into everything, we can't forget to mention the other pieces of media that really contributed to the year. Black Clover got a movie finally, beating the allegations and even started getting the carry by animation takes. With the manga also moving the Jump Giga to finish out its story, I can't wait to see just how much Tabata has managed to accomplish under better circumstances. Kaguya-sama also dropped this movie on Valentine's Day, being the romantic peak fiction that it is. This entire adaptation has been a passion project and it continues to show as our main couple finally manages to get together and begin their next steps in the romantic direction. All I'm saying is, Ishigami better win in the end. One Piece beat the live action curse, having one of the most successful adaptations into a live setting and even getting greenlit for a season 2. Not gonna lie, out of all the series to pull this off, I was not expecting it to be this one considering all the wacky elements and designs, but it goes to show that the passionate people under the right circumstances can really make the dream come true. With live action Chopper on the way, it's about to make Detective Pikachu and Baby Yoda look like fodder in comparison. Yu Yu Hakusho also got a live adaptation and I think it's been doing okay. Or maybe I'm just coping. Now, with all that being laid out, let's kick things off with the one anime that exposed anime fans' biggest skill, being extremely illiterate. <sighs> Vinland Saga is one of the first shows in a long time that I feel measures up to the level of captivation with its narrative similar to that of Attack on Titan but for completely different reasons. While there is action because the nature of the time period incites it to be so, this is a story that is about breaking free from that cycle of violence. Season 1 left us off with a new chapter beginning for Thorfinn and Season 2 kicks off with the introduction of Einar. Just like Thorfinn, a victim of the brutality of this world, family and home stolen, free will turned enslaved and with anger consuming his mind. I heard that the farmland arc was the limit test so to speak because for the most part this arc is about regaining the drive to rebuild and kickstart your life again and is much more dialogue heavy. Yet even when almost every episode was just characters having exchanges with each other, it always demanded my attention with some of the most impactful and powerfully delivered storylines this year. I found myself being able to grasp and understand the emotions that were being delivered and not a moment of agony or determination displayed by these characters went to waste. The presentation of of this second season was nothing to sneeze at either, with every story, every intense moment or depiction of imagery for the character developments and every thoroughly drawn shot being breathtaking. From Snake and Sparkle's dynamic to Arnaid's story with her husband and the child that was taken from her and even the young master's desire for battle leading to the major conflict, the emotions ran high all season long and once again I caught myself being glued to the screen unable to mutter a word each week. It's impressive how much work that is put into these characters as even the ones who won't be around for the full journey can leave such a strong impression even if it's just for one season. Some episodes were very hard to watch, others you could do nothing but shake your head as you can see the impending buildup adding more and more stakes by the week, and other times all you could do is rejoice to see some of the best character development this year with each of these things taking place primarily in one main setting. Thorfinn by far is one of the best written main characters I've had the pleasure to witness from his origins of blissful ignorance to being consumed with hatred and revenge, from letting go of the weight within the daggers and finding finding new purpose within the tools used to grow life. One of the most important season defining messages by Sverkel was that being empty means anything can fit inside of you and if you want to be reborn, being empty is the best way to be. When we saw him let go of those daggers in season 1, it was in that moment where his very soul was in the position to be reborn again into someone with a greater purpose. From his spiritual re-encounter with Askeladd and declaration of being a kinder person led to one of the best callbacks and his proper start for being a true warrior. From this point 
point of the story and onward, alongside Anar and whoever they may encounter in the future, our journey is headed in one direction and that's straight to Vinland. I'm sure this won't be the last time Thorfinn will have to raise his fist and I know the path to peace will continue to be full of trials and tribulations, but that very struggle is going to make the ending so satisfying to arrive at. Vinland Saga was the perfect show to kick off this year as we set out for peace with a firm handshake. The entertainment industry is full of all sorts of celebrities, with idols being a common one in places like Korea and Japan. Most notably, K-pop groups have become a major thing with collaborations amongst American celebrities especially, but as we all know, there is never all sunshine and rainbows in this industry. Oshinoko was the upcoming idol story that everyone had their eyes on coming out the strong promotional videos. It helped that Yoasobi's name was associated with the anime, and quite frankly, she was the ideal artist to get on board. Her J-pop discography was more than enough to convince the masses, and come episode 1, we were served one of the best premieres this year. A stellar presentation full of colors, plenty of banger songs and memes, and a conclusion that gave everyone a piece of depression. Wait, hold on. Ruby. <sighs> this is so not okay, man. I'm not gonna lie, as much as shock factors can be hit or miss for people, this one landed with a huge impact. What started out as a tragedy went towards the classic anime rebirth only to end up back at the start, but this time being 10 times worse. The reactions being some of the most emotional videos I've watched this year, like you know it's real when all the reactors just sit there in silence and cry, unable to say anything. An idol story now in the hands of Ai's children, and even then going on two different paths. With Aqua going down the revenge route, and Ruby following in her mother's footsteps. It's a contrast that had its interesting developments on both sides of the scale and managed to keep you coming back each week. Ruby's pursuit of the idol life had its natural challenges with finding members, getting popularity on social media, and pretty much all things considered in order to get your name out there. Aqua, on the other hand, had a lot more drama going on with trying to find his father, but also providing real insight into how brutal this industry is. Even within reality, time and time again, we see how the entertainment industry can affect people with how vulnerable one can become. You could be outright replaced, encumbered with expectations, and absolutely torn apart by the internet. These factors play a part when we see people have breakdowns or step away from their careers because of how taxing it can be. I came to appreciate this direction within the story because not often do we get to see this degree of ugliness within human nature have a grip on a character, especially with them being young adults, and it contains an important message. Alongside these two plot lines going at different paces, the anime really shine with its performance performances and actual show business at work, and it was an overall fun time. Season 1 was nothing revolutionary, but looking at the story within its parameters is far more enjoyable than trying to compare it because of the sheer hype, and I overall enjoyed myself. Idol was an incredible song that broke records and was on everyone's playlist. Kana took over the winter season as the best woman lead, and you can tell the team loved drawing her, and it wasn't too much long after the season that season 2 got announced. By far one of the most successful shows this year hands down, especially with the manga sales across the board. The major worry I have for the future of the series is definitely how the hunt for the father is handled. I don't think anybody minds Ruby pursuing her goal, but a lot of people are here for Aqua, and I just hope it doesn't fumble given it was the major hook of the show. If anything, I'll be back for Kana Supremacy, and hopefully this idol story continues to take off with it being this year's biggest star among the others. <laughs> When people hear that a title from years ago is coming back, 9 times out of 10, the first thing they think about is basically a remaster with today's upgrade of art and practices within animation. While there are shows like Soul Eater who do deserve an overall reboot because its anime went off course, Trigun is a bit of an interesting story. Earlier this year, I had come to learn that while the manga overall had a different direction, many liked the anime and were okay with how it ended. Reading about the series publication history and where the content diverges depending on which version you consume, I came to the conclusion that I would not choose to go consume either quite yet. Instead, I let the big question be answered of if Trigon were to come back today with a new vision that still attempts to honor both pieces of source material, how would it play out? This leading me to Trigon Stampede in one of my favorite anime this year. Right off the bat, the backlash towards this show was quite loud from the fact that it wasn't being done in 2D, which again shows how spoiled the anime community is, but also because Vash didn't have his iconic hairstyle. In the show, 
Joe's defense, change or deviations can be validated if you can at least let the material cook, and Stampede not only brought the hairstyle back, but Studio Orange managed to outdo themselves as to showing how far CGI has come and that it has a place in this medium as much as the rest does. A common critique that I have seen about the series was that Vash's and Knives' dynamic needed a lot more presence throughout the story, and Stampede took their relationship as brothers and made it the very backbone of the season. This first season told a tale of two brothers who were pursuing different paths beyond a self-inflicted tragedy. With Vash wanting to be a peaceful drifter living amongst humanity, knowing he will be blamed for his brother's crimes, and Knives doing what he could to create a utopia for his suffering people known as the Plants. Their methods opposing each other, which would eventually lead to their fateful confrontation, and that buildup was some of the most captivating and emotional storytelling offered. Knives was an extremely menacing antagonist who could be understood because of the sacrifices his people were subjected to. His fury clear as day, but his actions and mindset acting as a dilemma for Vash who strove to settle his problems without violence. I really like Vash because those characters who may choose to live their lives or act on the most unreasonable or insane principles, even when not really being human, are the ones that end up representing the best of human nature. If it weren't for the kindness of Rem and the love that she shared before her passing, Vash could have easily been on Knives' side, but it's because of that that Vash chose to carry her kindness into the new world even if it meant opposing his brother. Not to mention, he's kinda raw with the gun skills, I mean come on, his aim and even his reloads are so sick. We don't get such captivating brotherly opposition these days with main characters, and I feel that this is what makes Trigun Stampede so unique. Not to mention, even with this being a new take, there are still characters from the original material still present with Meryl and Wolfwood, and even new inclusions like Roberto. You could tell where the Stampede team were trying to honor their original source material with fresh reintroductions while also adding in their own characters to really help set the foundation for the future. In order to pull something like this off, you not only have to understand the source material, but also navigate through your new additions, and Stampede did that quite well. The event so far can be summarized to basically be a prequel considering Millie Thompson was introduced at the end, and I feel that a lot of the original elements fans know and love will really take their place in the upcoming season. The music was out of this world, the action was dynamic and impressive, and the finale was by far one of the best this year. As far as the future goes, it seems like the origins of Project Seed will be taking the stage once more, and what lies ahead in store for our main crew is up in the air, especially with Vash seemingly losing his memory. I'm really interested to see what happens to him, and how Wolfwood and Meryl fit back into the story, but above anything else, I truly believe that Stampede has a place for both new and old fans, and hopefully Season 2 will continue to deliver that message. まぶしくてまぶしくて僕は目をそらしてしまう。The slice of life and romance genre has come a long way, and Skip to Loafer was the show this year that offered the best of both worlds in one season. I've heard about this series for a long time now amongst the shoujo community, and I understand why given its cast and tropes at play. Over time, I've been opening up to giving shows like this a try, from Comey Can't Communicate to Insomniacs After School, and each time, I left with a smile on my face. Stories like this remind you that in life, there are plenty of things to smile about and people to share those smiles with, even if your personalities or lifestyles may differ from one another. Mitsumi being the country girl coming into the city and Shima being the former child actor were a silly duo meant for each other because of the aspects of each other they were able to find peace within. See, having differences and different backgrounds isn't exactly a bad thing as that just means there's an opportunity to come into and assimilate and other times there can also be less judgment towards one's flaws. See, regardless of knowing bits and pieces of his past, Mitsumi never judged Shima because she understood the type of person he was and is trying to be now and Shima came to open up because Mitsumi was somebody out of his usual bubble of expectations. She was studious, quirky in the fun ways, and overall a breath of fresh air that he needed. While the show has their drama and internal dilemmas amongst other characters, the one common theme that is highlighted is about people's differences and how they can still learn to get along with one another despite them. It doesn't matter if you're the shy bookworm, the popular girl, the envious girl, the good student, or the ones with trauma, it doesn't make anybody less human. People can always change and learn to open up, others can forgive and move 
move past the things that haunt them, and it's inspired by that willingness to heed the words of your peers beyond the differences. The show radiates warm feelings from being able to see how these characters become intertwined with each other throughout the Japanese high school year, and whether it's hanging out after school or participating in a school festival, this is what peak slice of life anime is all about. Of course, we can clearly see the build up between Shima and Mitsumi romantically, but you can also understand that it's going to be a slow burn, and quite frankly, I'm more than okay with that. The romance is gonna be there, but it's not something that is straight up driving the story on its own. It's about overcoming the daily school life academic struggles, the memories you share outside of school, the change you inspire in one another, and with all that being said, I left with a great first impression. Not to mention, that OP dancing sequence was some of the cutest stuff we got in an OP this year. I gotta give it the skip to Loafer because it really came swinging, and the best part is, is that it wasn't the only romance show that took the community by storm. You know, as a pretty heavy gamer myself, there were definitely some things you just couldn't help but laugh at within my love story with Yamada. Gaming leading to dating is a very common thing these days because Riot Games won't stop adding to the flames, and this anime was the show that Valorant and League of Legends players made their entire personalities revolve around worse than Zero Two. Akane is the hardworking ball of sunshine who's also the romantic loser. Charming in many ways from the amusing facial expressions and exaggerations and just an overall great character design. This show's art style really exemplifies amplifies how simple can be better, and even in game 2, it worked quite well with the gags. First episode in, Akane gets dumped and then runs into the surprisingly not chronically online male lead, Yamada. The absolute king of wanting to be left alone in dry responses, but with a heart that steadily begins to beat again for a romance. From an absolutely disaster class date to spending the night at his house while he games all night and soon discovering that they're guildmates, the relationship of these two kept me laughing. If it wasn't Akane overthinking, it was Yamada being Yamada, and if not that than the Sasaki sibling shenanigans pushing the romance. Big day for people who are fans of this creature. On a real note, I wasn't expecting the story to get serious on Yamada's behalf, but I think the backstory of why he is the way he is when it comes to reciprocating feelings was necessary to add good characterization. In life, there are times where even if you don't want to hurt anybody, you can end up doing damage by not saying the right thing, and it can really affect how you may interact with people in the future. While Yamada could have just kept playing games and avoiding the problems altogether, it doesn't lead to overcoming them. Between Akane's antics and the time they spent together, which allowed them to see each other's better inner qualities, you couldn't blame them for liking each other. She brought Yamada back out his shell, and the little things he did meant everything to her. In short, Yamada beat the e-boy allegations. The show overall was just a really cute good time, and it helped that the direction was very creative to really sell the comedic nature from all things gaming and student life considered, and that OP was kinda a banger. This is how you appeal to a certain demographic of anime fans the right way, and I really hope to see this get a second season because let's be honest, this was kinda a weekly addiction. Not saying I should do this, but maybe one game of Valorant can't be that bad, right? <laughs> year round, we pay attention to the seasonal lineup when it comes to upcoming adaptations, but there is always at least one show that makes a splash and it comes from absolutely out of nowhere. Heavenly Delusion was in one way to describe it a lot. It's been a long time since we had a show about surviving in a post-apocalyptic society full of so much unknown and mystique, and the show just kept on adding questions each week. A devastated Japan, monsters each with their own unique designs and attacks, two storylines progressing that slowly tie into each other, and each week it just kept on getting better. The production value of the show being quite high, with some episodes having all sorts of talent come by and direction explored, and yet some of the content was so disturbing and unsettling, but was also narratively interesting. A journey to a supposed man-made heaven didn't come without some dark episodes alongside the struggle itself of just navigating in such a dangerous setting. The present having Maru and Kiriko's story, while the past having the children of heaven and showing their struggles within the facility. It's this twisted psychological hell that we kept seeing throughout the season that made me wonder what exactly is heaven and what is the end goal. Upon the finale, it became apparent that the children of heaven are the reason why the modern day society collapsed, and if that's true, then holy f what happened, man? I need to know what is this heaven project and its purpose, who or what attacked the facility, is Maru one of the babies born from Tokyo, which is why he has those powers, and what is the end game that clearly relates to the title. There cannot be some form of heaven on earth because we all know what happens when people try to play God, but when we do get there, what will we find? If there is one thing that everybody can vouch for, it's the mystery aspect of the show. You meet so many different characters, each having their own morals and functions, and it paints a vivid picture for how 
people can be affected in this time period. Some survivors of the catastrophic new age and others yearning for some form of peace that can only be obtained through bloodshed. You couldn't summarize a show like this in a paragraph even if you wanted to, but that is exactly why we love stories like this. It piques our interest and in many ways surprises us with its narrative choices, and it would be offensive to not say that Heavenly Delusion was one of the most important shows to define this year. It's pretty easy to get caught up in the corporate work cycle. You wake up, you go to work, you come back home, and you slave away over and over again. It's that very cycle that makes you feel like a zombie, and Zom 100 kicked into high gear about breaking away from it, but not without its own twist. Not gonna lie, if a zombie apocalypse broke out tomorrow, I'm 100% cooked, but for our main crew, they had other plans in mind. A bucket list knocking out all the things that they want to do before they eventually become turned is by far one of the funnest animes that could have come out during the summer season to come Complement the energy that is summer break. No more work, no more bosses, everything is essentially free now and the only thing you do have to worry about is not getting bitten. It's an outrageous concept but it's also a crazy good time because who cares about all the rules when you can steal the best TV to play games on or ride a motorcycle over an explosion like your Tom Cruise. Episode 1 had one of the best hooks up there with Oshinoko with the transition of Akira's life being black and white during his time as an exploited corporate worker to grabbing the aspect ratio and the whole show turning into a colorful chaotic paradise. From something as simple to drinking beer to visiting a hot spring and even having a My Hero Academia plus Ultra moment when fighting a zombie shark, this show's got a little bit of everything. Of course, I think the underlying message is about taking back your life and your time. Outside of work, there are people who you need to see, places you need to go, opportunities and chances you need to capitalize on, and even in a city full of the undead and the chance of death looming around the corner, the reasons to live shine brighter. It's unfortunate that this show ended up having some behind the scenes issues because I'm pretty sure by the time of this video that the last set of episodes will be airing like tomorrow. I felt it was necessary to include this anime because had things been in a better spot overall, this easily would have made a thorough impression from beginning to end. So please, make sure to binge the last few episodes tomorrow and hopefully this won't be the last time we get to see this anime. <laughs> Every big shonen series has the dividing game changer arc of its story. Black Clover's is the Spade Kingdom War, My Hero Academia is the Paranormal Liberation War, and we are now wrapping up the Shibuya incident for Jujutsu Kaisen. Season 2 this year had a lot of everything surrounding it. From the controversy surrounding Studio Mappa to absolutely out of this world episodes, this year is easily one for the books when it comes to JJK. Before Shibuya, we kicked off the season with Hidden Inventory, a younger set of teachers giving us the last bit of context we needed that also explains the developments of Volume 0, but also bringing the male equivalent of Makima in terms of the thirst levels being aka Toji Fushiguro. With the new director as well, things were looking pretty hype for this second season, and Shibuya just kept the momentum going. It's no secret that JJK, among other shows, is one of the leading anime of fall. From Yuji vs Choso and its elite hand-to-hand -hand combat, to the absolutely catastrophic display of Sakuna vs Jogo and Mahoraga, and even the deaths of characters like Nanami and Sto Nobara being up in the air, it's been a roller coaster all season long. MAPPA clearly recognizes where JJK stands in terms of reception among the world, and it shows with them producing results by any means necessary. There are so many times I have wondered just how in the world is this coming to life so epically, and sometimes you just gotta sit there in awe and accept the fact that this season did not come to mess around. Even the anime only editions have been met with a positive reception, and it's that level of effort you gotta respect. It's a great time to be a JJK fan, and the chaos is only going to continue to rise heading into the post Shibuya events. This is shown in anime at its best with all the meathead action you could ask for. We've had mech fights, OP characters doing what they do best, Sakuna still radiating unlimited aura, Yuji going through an insane amount of depression and still throwing hands and we're still not done. I'm telling my anime only crowd right now that if you love this season then I guarantee you, you will love the rest of the story. Raw Tax has never looked this good and you really gotta give it to the JJK team for doing what they do. Gojo's locked up, bodies are hitting the floor, people are crying over character deaths, yep, this right here is exactly what we read for. By the time this season is over, people are going to be depressed like Yuji, and believe me when I say that it'll only get worse.
You know, I've already made a video about Free Rain, but there's just no way it wouldn't make it onto this list. Even when Jujutsu Kaisen and Undead Unluck is airing, Free Rain has managed to be a spectacular anime in the category of fantasy of all things as well. Fantasy anime can have a hard time getting people to try new things out of it because people are either A, just waiting for returning series, or B, cannot stand the degenerate nonsense, especially if it's within an isekai. But this show right here is the best dose of fresh air that we all needed this year. When was the last time we got an adventure anime with so much heart that plays to the classic day-to-day -day party member tropes. A journey of understanding one's feelings has turned into such a captivating and emotional story about overcoming many walls, expressing that change from within, and living with a purpose. The narrative sits in the same boat next to Villain Saga, where sure, we're gonna get action from time to time as that's part of the whole adventure experience, but that's not what we are mainly here for. At the core of the story lies an elf who underestimated the level of emotions that can come when the speed of time takes her comrades fleeting lives away from her. She's on a journey to have that last conversation, to make up for the time that was lost, and it's something that society can underestimate too. As I mentioned earlier, life will keep us busy, and before you know it, we're about to head into 2024. Many people probably haven't spoken to the individuals they need to, and others ran out of time before having those final exchanges. It's a bittersweet theme because all of our times will come someday, but it's important to do what we can with our lives as it's only too late when you give up. From fighting monsters and traveling from town to town, engaging with with different townsfolk and customs, and even the silly party moments with Freeman and Fern having the best reaction images this year, the writing weaves within our cast makes everything flow just right. Every flashback we get reminds us how our characters have changed in the present, and my overall experience with this show has been quite positive, and I'm happy the level of success has skyrocketed. Freeman is a journey of heart, and it's worn on its sleeve with such consistent storytelling in the works, and as it stands now, this could easily end up being one of the best series within the medium someday, and I can't wait to see what lies ahead ahead. I think the funniest part about Scout Program getting an anime is that people were upset the takes off part was literal and thought it was just there for pizzazz. There are many pieces of media from my younger days that I just can't forget, and the world created by Brian O'Malley is one of them. From the live action movie that still manages to age nicely, to the comics and even the console game that really brings the fights out to their best, there's a lot to enjoy within this abnormal story of securing the dream girl. Subconscious highways, enemies that turn into change when beaten, seven evil exes with different fighting styles, you kinda just get down with the vibe of it all without needing explanations. I understand that fans wanted a live action or comic book copy and paste within the anime, but there's a lot more to consider at play here. Just like Trigun Stampede, if you have the opportunity to revive a title once more, why waste the chance of not doing something unique but still in line with the elements people know and love? Takes off is Ramona's story and her journey of patching things up with those exes she moved on from. See, in the live action, we were told that Ramona always kinda dipped out from her problems and we also knew the exes as evil because that's what the story told us. This time, we get to see a lot more humanization of them and how Ramona's own tendencies affected some of them. Roxy's fight being one of the coolest sequences and a contender for fight of the year represented how leaving without ending things the right way can hurt and linger. Being able to see all these different sides of the exes within their own unique episodic lifestyles was quite amusing and there were a lot more additions at large as well. While it's got a lot more screen time and a whole lot of trailer time, young Neil was actually pretty funny this time around and even Gideon turned a new leaf and with Julie of all people. Obviously a no does statement, but relationships are hard. It's very easy to become discouraged when there's a lack of communication, and the plot line with future Scott presented that while also offering an ultimatum for Ramona as well. Rather than running away once more and trying to avoid the worst timeline altogether, she chose to love herself and face her commitment issues, mirroring how Scott also leveled up in the live action and gained some self-respect. A much sweeter ending that still gave us that happy ending. Look, I'm not here to argue with anybody who dislikes this direction, because expectations will be expectations, but this is a love letter with a spin on the original content, and I think this can be considered a win for many fans of the series. Though let's be honest, if there's one group of people who really won, it's definitely the Yuri fans. Every anime that I have talked about has contributed to this year in various ways, but there is a clear series that this year truly belongs to, and that is One Piece. Let it be known that I'm just an anime only, and what I witnessed this year was some of the most incredible consistency from a shonen anime on a weekly basis. It was already crazy enough to see episode 1015, which is still my favorite episode to date, but then the team manages to go and outdo themselves across multiple occasions. I'm well aware that One Piece is Japan's baby, but God 
glad that they make sure to show it this time around. Wano is the arc that I managed to go into college with and graduate with, and it's been a heck of a long ride through the many nights of hype and emotions running high. A prophecy foretold to one day free the people of Wano has led to one of the longest fights between the giants of the new generation and the former emperors of the sea. From Sanji vs Queen, Zoro vs King, Law and Kid vs Big Mom, and then Luffy vs Kaido, not even I could fathom how this was going on practically back to back each week. It's impressive how the One Piece team was able to accumulate the insane talent by the likes of Vincent Chancer and Henry Thurlow to Ota and among the rest of their peers which led to such an unforgettable presentation. It only became an even more special year for One Piece fans with Gear 5 being the next big 3 MC transformation we have gotten in a long time. Joy Boy returning in a climatic arc that has the souls of thousands riding on it is a heck of a headline for a big war arc and it delivered amazingly. Being able to fight however one chooses from catching lightning to just tune for shenanigans is very different but it's a different I'm willing to get behind because of how unique the approach is. Not even Kaido could believe what he had to put up with. I definitely do have some narrative gripes with Wano and I also know that One Piece pacing is still doing what it does best but in the face of results what else could you want? From the art style change and improvements across the board this art felt like a love letter to fans to show how passionate the people who work on this anime are. Being able to remain at the top unbothered by the worry of a fall off or a presentational decline in today's community and industry is an honest flex and you really gotta give it to Oda for hanging in there all this time. We've had bangers, we've had some amazing first episodes, some moments that made us even cry and others jaw drop, but 2023 hands down belongs to the Straw Hats and the future king of the pirates. <laughs> Whether I mention the show you like this year or not, this year was another fantastic run for anime and as a long time consumer, I'm just happy to be able to enjoy the seasons and their gems. This medium, this community means so much to so many people and it's because of that that I continue to create. I've talked about a lot this time around and next year we'll be running it back but before I close this video out, I just want to say thank you for everything this year. All of your support has been the best form of motivation and I hope to be able to continue growing with you all come next year. As the curtains close, we say thank you Anime 2023, it's been an absolute pleasure. That's pretty much it from me though. As always, thank you for watching and make sure to leave what anime made your year in the comment section down below. Stay warm out there, have a safe Christmas and new year and I will catch you all in 2024.